Welcome to the New South Wales Water Story Series, sharing experiences and delivering water-sensitive city approaches across coastal, regional, and urban areas of New South Wales. My name is Michael Rosenthal, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. We have been working with Cooperative Research Centre for Water-Sensitive Cities to develop this series to better understand the challenges, opportunities, and value in implementing water-sensitive cities solutions. In today's episode, we will explore implementation across urban catchments. I am joined by Sue Burton from the Cooks River Alliance, Sarah Joyce from the Sydney Coastal Councils Group, and Nell Graham from the Parramatta River Catchment Group. To kick things off, I'll have my guests introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about uh, where they work. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So my name's Sue Burton. I'm the executive officer of the Cooks River Alliance. The Cooks River starts around Bankstown in Sydney and runs for 23 kilometres or so uh, down to the airport. If you've flown into Sydney, you've flown over what once was the mouth of the Cooks River. Uh, it's considered one of the most polluted urban rivers in Australia and uh, we're working hard to try and change that uh, dubious honour. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Joyce, the Executive Officer of the Sydney Coastal Councils Group. We represent nine coastal and estuarine councils from northern beaches down to Sutherland and then the outer harbours of Sydney Harbour. We uh, represent over one and a half million people and we help our councils through several ways, advocacy, collaboration, capacity building and research. Hi, I'm Nell Graham from the Parramatta River Catchment Group. Um, the Parramatta River runs from uh, Blacktown to Cockatoo Island at the kind of beginning of Sydney Harbour. Uh, it's a very large uh, catchment and uh, there's 11 local government areas within that catchment. What are some of the key initiatives that you have implemented to drive change toward a water sensitive city? The kind of initiatives that an alliance, a collaborative approach needs to do is to really facilitate a whole river and catchment approach. And so rather than facilitate or implement action on the ground, we're more working collaboratively with um, those agencies who have responsibility for action on the ground. So probably the most recent project was the CRC, Water Sensitive Cities Research Synthesis Project, um, over the last two years in Sydney, uh, the Sydney to Bankstown Rail Corridor. Um, 11 stations fell mostly within the Cooks River and there was an opportunity for the CRC to work with uh, the councils, uh, Inner West Council and Canberra Bankstown Council, both uh, Alliance members, um, Sydney Water, Department of Planning, Greater Sydney Commission and other sort of other players there to look at um, what might it look like if that corridor and the proposed housing in that corridor was designed along with water at its centre, with water at the heart of the design. Um, and what we came up with was a highly collaborative approach that over a period of months of workshops, where we went and viewed uh, the whole uh, area. And we looked and we focused on two case studies, one Campsie in Canterbury Bankstown's area and Marrickville. Uh, in, in West Council's area. And the came up with some principles to look at uh, how to manage those areas in terms of planning, but also to look at actual building typologies. It's quite exciting because at the same time, uh, we have uh, master planning happening for both those areas. And so there was an opportunity there to, for councils to take the learnings from that process and incorporate it in their master planning. What has been the most challenging aspect of these initiatives and is it, is it spending a lot of time looking for funding? Is it collaboration? What are some of the key challenges that you've faced? So it has been that disjointed um, management of stormwater infrastructure. There's so many different agencies. You really do need to have that collaborative framework. It, it's also a challenge for the community that see uh, the degradation, the litter, the water, the flooding and what action right now. Um, and that's a challenge for councils to manage those expectations 
what we've inherited in the Cooks River is um, a series of uh, infrastructure and engineering solutions that uh, were done in haste by today's standards. So I, I find one of the challenges is balancing that need to plan and be very careful uh, to think about what uh, future generations are inheriting in terms of uh, river infrastructure and river planning and uh, th that need to have something happen right now because the community are fed up with uh, over 150 years in our case of um, urbanisation and uh, degradation. And, you know, in the Parramatta, they Parramatta River, they want to swim. Uh, they'd like to swim in the Cooks, but we're a long way away from that. So that, that's a bit of a challenge, balancing um, planning with the, the time frame and, and all the other challenges associated with um, the disjointed uh, water management system that we have in New South Wales. So it's adding on to that is the challenges with collaboration and, you know, an overall lack of leadership on, you know, water conservation, water quality generally. Um, and, you know, the, the need for stronger regulation um, to enable councils to be able to put, you know, what water sensitive urban design in practice and actually, you know, get appropriate funding to actually deliver them. Because it's well and good just to be able to afford to put, you know, water sensitive urban design measures in, but there's a need to maintain them. Um, to monitor their effectiveness. And unless you've got that sort of leadership and, and strong support from the Commonwealth and the state government, they find that can be really challenging. And that's where us as catchment groups, you know, are trying to fill that gap and, and step in. So nobody owns or manages stormwater. We don't have any uh, legislation on quality volume. And so consequently, it's a massively wasted resource. Uh, and I think that's another challenge is uh, getting community to understand that and changing the thinking. So um, we currently take uh, all our water from uh, other people's catchments in Warragamba um, and above, above the dam. Uh, and we're using that and people don't make the connection between the water they drink and rainwater and the value of stormwater. So it, it's a huge challenge. We're sort of working in making stormwater valuable so that it doesn't trash our waterways so much. Uh, we, we're going against the tide in a way of uh, current practice and planning, but uh, that's changing. You may have a really dedicated and enthusiastic council or group of councils who want to implement appropriate measures, but it needs funding to deliver these things and it can be really expensive. And so that's where, you know, collaborative partnership is needed between state, and local government. So recently with the Minister Hancock announcing the Coast and Estuary Grant funding changes, um, it's providing greater uh, funding to measures such as water sensitive urban design once a, a certified CMP is in place. Um, even, you know, the need for stronger regulation amendments to things such as basics, sites such as industrial zoned areas to be required to incorporate water sensitive urban design would also be needed as well. What positive outcomes have you seen from these initiatives? Um, are, you, are we making progress? Are we getting better? Can you guys speak to a little bit of that for, that you guys have noticed from your work? Sure, so some of the positive outcomes we've seen, I think from our perspective, some of that leadership being taken on by the Greater Sydney Commission and setting you know, clear objectives for water conservation, water quality, and that then driving um, and ensuring alignment with local strategic planning statements and then onto the LEPs and DCPs. So really setting up that planning framework. The government recognising the need for funding to support the infrastructure and, and its maintenance and, and the, the planning side through the Coast and Estuary Grant funding that has um, recently been amended. So originally it was 50-50 funding. Now the state government's committing to $2 for every um, $1. I think also that, you know, we have recognised the need for, you know, water to be best managed at a catchment scale. And this is where, you know, groups such as us, you know, really sort of come in and benefit councils, but also bringing together collaborative partners across the catchment. 
And I think that's a really sort of positive step moving forward. The other win is becoming more accepted that collaborative approaches are the way to go. There's a, a change that um, these issues we've been facing, fire, drought, um, smoke, uh, can't be resolved by one body alone, that collaboration is more popular. Could you just expand on, on what the role of the catchment groups is in facilitating that collaboration and as well as involved in actual catchment management? Uh, what we manage are people organisations. So the facilitation across and not having to uh, manage a piece of infrastructure, build, etc., frees you up to work collaboratively across organisations. Really important thing that catchment groups do is educate and engage with the community as well. So it's not only your key, your, your kind of agency stakeholders that you need to bring along, but you need to bring the community along with you as well and to educate about, you know, water as a precious resource. The work that we've done where collaboration requires local governments working closely with state agencies, that needs to come from the ministerial level. Um, that collaboration can achieve many benefits for individual organisations to augment their work, um, leverage off their work and improve consistency that, you know, councils are committed to achieving similar goals and protecting similar values and that the work that we're trying to achieve can actually really support their work and their programs and that's a really important selling point. What are some of the future threats that are emerging um, in relation to water sensitive cities and, and, and how, how is your work addressing those threats and what, what's the outlook? The New South Wales government quite a few years ago um, committed to undertaking a threat and risk assessment framework to identify what are those priority threats and that was um, supported by a New South Wales Community Survey and the priority threat that was identified through that process was water pollution was the priority threat for the New South Wales community and a focus of now called the Marine Estate Management Strategy. And so I think that, you know, is really where the Sydney Coastal Councils Group assists its, its councils um, in addressing that priority threat. But what is that threat going to look like under a claim, changing climate and with a population increase of one and a half million people over the next 20 years in the Sydney Basin? So what we know is that, you know, there's going to be changes in weather patterns likely to leading to greater frequency of drought. We also know that it's going to be hotter and people are going to want to be able to recreate in the water to cool off. And so that's going to put pressure on existing infrastructure and services. And so it's needing for, you know, leadership through, um, you know, catchment groups, state agencies um, and collaborations with local councils to be proactive in this space, to be, you know, understanding what those threats are going to look like and what the implications are going to be. And so we can start putting in a plan now um, so that in 10 years or 20 years time, we are still um, enabling those values that we know our community values today um, are still in place in the future. Area that might need a little bit more research is groundwater. So the Cook sits on the Botany Sands Aquifer, which flows right up to Sydney, Sydney and uh, um, that whole lower part. And, you know, 20,000 years ago, it was one, one and the same. So Gubbamora Swamp was interchangeable with uh, the Botany Sands Aquifer. And further up the Georges River, there's other aquifers, and I'm assuming around Parramatta. So uh, it, it, there is an interrelationship in the water system between the water on the land the water in the estuaries and the water under the ground. And we tend to, at the moment, discount what's going on under the ground. But for those councils and those areas that are close to the end of an estuary, like Bayside, um, it, it's a real problem for them. So water sensitive design principles need to be different. Uh, rain gardens don't work when there's nowhere for the water to go. Uh, so it, it's a, that relationship with groundwater in that perfect storm in the future sea level rise scenario of rising groundwater tables, which may have some toxic element in them, 
a dilemma there about you know the role of groundwater in bringing forward polluted sources. So what advice for others do you have, no matter where they are in their transition, that you guys have learned from, from your experience working in this space that you can share? It really comes down to is being really clear on the why. Um, and this is something that we've been really, you know, conscious of is that why are we trying to do this work? And it really comes down to those values that everyone in the community um, appreciates. And those can be different depending on the community. So you might have in one instance, a community who really values playing soccer on green grass. And so that can build your argument for, you know, recycling stormwater um, and being able to use that water um, on parks and gardens by the council to justify um, the cost of that new infrastructure. Or it might be to be able to swim on a beautiful beach, which means, you know, that requires growth pollutant traps to be of a higher standard and, and monitored and managed to ensure you know they be, they continue to be effective. Governance needs to be managed along with everything else and governance structures need to be fit for purpose. What is your vision for water sensitive cities in New South Wales? I think a water sensitive city for New South Wales is where water is treated as a precious resource where we reduce runoff to um, receiving waters. Water sensitive cities are cities that make way and space for rivers. A vision for us incorporating a water sensitive city is to have a resilient, healthy coastal and estuarine environment that is protected and conserved for future generations.